Welcome again. And so uh, my name is Roy Zhou. I'm the director for IBM's accessibility research team. And such a great honor to be here with you and also with the distinguished panel here. And so uh, the panel, this panel is about the impact of artificial intelligence on accessibility. And uh, what I'll do is I will give a short introduction and then we'll let the panelists introduce themselves before we dive into the discussions. And I hope to leave about five, 10 minutes at the end for questions. So Peter, when, how much time do we have, one hour? Okay, we have one hour, it's 10.30 now. So I'd like to begin with you know, accessibility. What does accessibility mean in technology, right? This is about reinventing the relationship between humans and technology to ensure that people with all abilities have equal sex access to, to technology and to information. So I would say we're in a time where accessibility is more important and full of opportunities than ever. Uh, largely driven by three areas, three uh, drivers, right? Uh, one is essentially uh, the emergence of technology, new technologies at record pace, and many of you work in the technology field, I don't even need to say too much. The second is the demand for accessibility has been increasing. And today we're talking about 1.2 billion people uh, with disabilities uh, in this world. And as the aging demographic shift is happening quickly, that number is going to increase much faster. Uh, many of you probably already realize. And we're at the tipping point where people 65 and older is, gonna, is exceeding the population of young children, five and uh, younger, for the first time in human history. And among the, you know, the aging population, people 60 and older, 40% of them have at least one disability. And many of them acquire over time multiple disabilities and coupled with um, chronic diseases. That's a second driving force. The third one I'd like to add is because, I mean, I would say more than ever, people actually have the empathy, passion, enthusiasm, accessibility. Because I just came from Grace Harper Conference. I was so touched by these young students, their commitment, and also their awareness about accessibility. I ended up with a stack of resumes for people want to work in accessibility research area. So extremely exciting. So these are the three you know, driving forces reshaping the landscape of accessibility. So that's essentially a short introduction of the topic. And so now I'd like to um, have our distinguished panel uh, to introduce themselves. How about we start, uh, start with you, Sassy? My name is Sassy Outwater, right? And I am the director of the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And my background is in UX, user experience, and I specialize in intersectionality of disability and society and technology and how those three things interplay with one another, the social ramifications of using AI within user experience and within assistive technology, especially in the areas of instruction. The Massachusetts Association for the Blind and the Visually Impaired just recently launched the Vibrant program, which specifically teaches seniors and those who are aging with vision loss to use assistive technology. And the UX implications of this are huge, and we're just now diving into all of it. But AI is becoming one of the most important tools that we have to work with seniors with vision loss and other disabilities, especially when multiple disabilities intersect. I have a mic. Okay. Uh, I'm Sujit, Sujit Kanuganti. Um, I'm the CTO at IRA. I have various technological background, right from robotics, industrial automation, networking, cloud. Uh, I've been in the hardware and software space for a while. And now I'm with uh, IRA building uh, IRA product. I've been leading IRA for the past two years, building the product right from its scratch, and now leading implementing AI in the IRA product itself to bring uh, greater services to the visually impaired. Tom? Hi, I'm Tom Newman. I'm the Chief Technical Officer at Red Endeavor. We are providing a virtual reality solution to senior living communities in order to help improve quality of life. My background is in software development and computer science. Will? Good morning, or yeah, still morning. I'm still Will morning. Walker. I'm a vice president of product at a company called Open Access Technologies. Uh, we focus on accessible content. 
Uh, my past uh, has been around developing new technologies for screen reading and for accessibility. I was involved in the uh, early access of the API-based approach to screen reading. It got rid of virtual buffers. That led to uh, various things such as the Linux accessibility product where we uh, led the Orca screen reader, which is one of the best screen readers for Linux available today. Uh, so I come to this space with that kind of background and perspective. Good morning. Uh, my name is Micah Altman. I am director of research at the MIT Libraries. Uh, I'm a reformed computer scientist and then a reformed quantitative social scientist and now an information scientist. Um, my, my research has focused on, on things like the role of information communication technology in politics and, and the way that people participate in developing information and now focuses on scholarly communication and how we manage and disseminate knowledge in, in the university and through research. Uh, I'm new to accessibility formally, uh, although have had an interest in, in accessibility technologies for, for a couple decades for family reasons, but we, in the last few years, we've started to look at um, learning and the, the elements of, of learning in online systems and how that affects people with learning disabilities and uh, we have a, a new, very exploratory project on looking at library and information systems and what design principles can make them more inclusive and accessible. I would have to say, what an impressive panel. You would all agree with me, right? And so, yeah. <laughs> Let's waste no time to pick their brains. So I like to start with AI, right? Um, Artificial intelligence, that's the main topic. It's, it's a buzzword. And exactly a month ago, IBM announced $240 million of, of investment over the next 10 years to have a joint AI lab with MIT. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, many tech companies are making huge investment in, in, in AI. So we would like to you know, um, get your view, because you've been in accessibility for a long time, and also um, AI. Is, 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 a, is a new emerging thing. So what's your view in terms of um, AI and machine learning? How will they impact accessibility? Sure, I, I'm gonna go back to some of the early work we did, with, which I call the API-based approach to accessibility. And what that enabled people to do, and this was back in the early 90s and, and mid 90s and so on, it enabled screen readers to get inside the running application. Okay, and it, it, it provided very compelling access to applications. The screen reader no longer had to guess what was inside there. It could query the application directly. Uh, I'm very proud of that work, but at the same time, um, I think it's time to move on. It's potentially time to, to get rid of that. And the problem that it led to was that in order to get this API-based approach to accessibility to work, it required cooperation from the people writing the GUI toolkits and the people writing the applications. And you'll see that with ARIA today, okay? You'll, saw, you'll see the uh, accessibility guidelines. People have to implement the toolkit. They have to implement the API. And what that causes is a big lag. So new technology comes out and there's an accessibility lag between the time that technology comes out and it's made accessible. Okay, so what I see as a potential here, and I'm not saying it's, it's going to come true, but what I see as a potential is that artificial intelligence can now start getting rid of the need for an API to dig inside the application, and it can actually infer and, and, and um, determine what's being presented on the screen by artificial intelligence. And do you have some examples of you know, product and services already taking advantage of AI? And also from your uh, development uh, experience, years of development experience, how AI can be woven into uh, the technology development process? Well, let me, let me say how I can imagine it would be, okay? So uh, I think Kiyoko's talk was very, very wonderful about real world accessibility, and I think that's beautiful and wonderful and valid. Uh, we're still gonna be sitting behind screens of glass that are presenting uh, uh, information to us. Okay, so I can imagine now um, when the new cool kid comes along five years from now that says he's got a brand new technology, and all that brand new technology is is another way to draw a push button on a screen. Okay, I think what we can do is have artificial intelligence be the thing to recognize this is a push button, and they can help guide the user through the interface. And not only be able to guide the user through small pieces of the interface, like individual components, this is a push button, this is a checkbox, but also be able to provide summarization of what's being presented to, to them on the screen. 
Yeah, thank you. Well, very insightful, very insightful. Now let's also take a look at the reason we actually develop this new technology in AI. It's really to improve people's lives, right? And we have some of the panelists like entrepreneur and working in, on gadgets, working on platforms, right, to inform people's life. And so I'd like to pose a question to you, uh, suggest Tom and also Sassy, and how can digital and AI innovation enhance independence and improve quality of life? Especially we're talking about the aging population. 90% of those people say they want to age in place. Uh, they want to age in their own home and they want to live independently. So I'd like to get your view about AI and digital technology can enhance and improve people's quality of life. Who would like to go first? I'll get yeah, sure. I, I could go first. So we use virtual reality with the aging population to do exactly that, to try and improve their quality of life. And the reality is that for a lot of people, physical travel is difficult and rare. And we can use VR to open up the world for them again. We can take people to places they may have always wanted to go but didn't have a chance to visit. For example, we can take them on a tour of Paris or to the top of Mount Everest. We can bring them back to places that are important to them, like their childhood home. They can walk the streets of the neighborhood they grew up in. And we can also let them be there for important moments in the lives of family members. So they can attend, say, a granddaughter's wedding taking place on another continent. And a lot of people think of VR as sort of inherently isolating, but we've made it a social experience. You can do all of these things together. And I actually think VR has a lot of potential to bring people together. It allows you to have a sense of presence with someone you can sort of feel as if you are actually in the same space as another person who might be on the other side of the world, which I think can, can make a huge difference for people. Yeah, actually, I was sharing with him that the, you know, I, my father is uh, in his 80s, and now in his bed, he no, can no longer move. And he actually always wanted to go to Disney when Disney first opened in Shanghai. I was asking Tom, can you, you, know, can you give, me that, give my father that kind of experience, right? He's, he's dreaming about it. Thank you, Tom. And, um, and, and Sassy and, and, and Sujath, would you like to add? Yeah, sure. Uh, we at IRA, we provide, uh, we develop services for the visually impaired. So what we do is like connect the visually impaired with a human in the loop, like a sighted person uh, who is sitting behind a computer at a remote location, be it anywhere in US as of now. What we do is we equip the uh, visually impaired with a pair of smart glasses and do a live video streaming from the user space to a agent or IRA agent, what we call, sitting behind the computer and having the first point of uh, video from the first point of view. And so we'll be... Ivory glasses right here. Hey, John. Hey. Yeah. So I'm uh, the demonstration guy. <laughs> yeah. John, as of now, is wearing uh, IRA smart glasses and he's an IRA explorer. Probably John, I think, will you be able to do a demo? But yeah, that's the last call, last minute call, but you we'll see. You don't want me to do a demo, thank you. But okay. That's yeah, so what we do is like we connect uh, the users to remote agents and uh, remote agents will be able to relay information through the video that's coming in from the smart glasses. And it, there are like ample uh, scenarios where user needs information from a set person and they can rely on our service. Uh, say, take the case of uh, going for a shopping, uh, user wants to do his own shopping independently, uh, is, wants to go to a grocery store, pick up the items uh, like brownies, whatever he likes, the specific ones, uh, IRA agent will be able to help using the video feed that is coming in. Uh, say a user is traveling, is at an airport, he needs to clear the check-in, go to the uh, gate, uh, IRA agent will be able to again help the uh, person in real time. And AI is also playing a role in making this more accessible, both on the agent side and also on the user side. On the agent side, we do provide more uh, enriched information to the agent so that agent need not search for that information specifically based on the need, but it pops up automatically so that it becomes faster for agent to provide or the relay the information. And from user point of view, there are a lot of other capabilities being added which is like identifying uh, persons in front of them, detecting their emotions. Like we use a uh, lot of available AI technologies to bring this accessibility to the users, be it uh, IBM Watson, we are, which we are trying, and there are other providers 
uh, in space of like facial recognition or image recognition or object recognition. We also enabling the system to have a voice based interaction uh, where user can interact with the system uh, using speech and system will be able to provide the information and if in case it unable to find that information it can automatically connect to an agent and agent can relay that information. Thank you. And Sassy, would you like to provide your view? Yep. So for the aging population, you have physical disability and cognitive disability, and they intersect in pretty unique places that don't often happen in the rest of the population. And you see AI stepping in, whether it be from a neurological point of view. Um, Tom brought up a, a very valuable tool that helps recover from dementia and stroke uh, memory loss, triggering memory and cognition skills through the use of sensory input is a valuable use of AI. Um, and when combined with EEG monitoring and functional magnetic resonance imaging, you can be looking at what the brain, if the person, say, with dementia is, is going through, and the virtual reality can respond to that using AI algorithms and can continue to feed a person a certain experience or memory or something that is triggering a sensory response turning into a memory response or an envision response of a future event. And it gives neurologists a whole new viewpoint of dementia and brain recovery and traumatic brain injury. This is used a lot with, uh, at least from the research standard right now, with veterans um, that have TBI, traumatic brain injury, um, and is a valuable tool for neurological recovery for patients who have lost the ability to speak or the lost the ability to move certain parts of their body. Uh, memory experiences can trigger, uh, you know, the beginnings of, of nerve responses in limbs, things like that. So there's a whole bunch of research in the medical side of disability that especially intersects with seniors. And the other piece of, of AI that intersects here is what Will touched on with screen readers for the blind and, and low vision population. We see a lot of um, screen reader lag from accessibility and a senior comes in and they want the same experience that they had a year ago as a fully sighted individual. Now they've lost a significant amount of vision and can't have that experience. Or they haven't used technology and they're entering into that um, space now that they need to rely on technology to um, do things that their vision used to accomplish for them. And there's a lot of emotions that get brought up with that experience. Anger, frustration, fear, sorrow. Um, and AI, I call it the smart screen reader theory. It's not completely in practice yet, but certain, certain spaces you're starting to see screen readers do that inference process that Will was talking about where they can look at a web page or an, an app um, and infer things that the coder maybe didn't get in there correctly from accessibility guideline perspective. So the screen reader is now evolving away from the traditional screen reader model and turning into something that can infer context and infer action based on what it's seeing. And I think this is brilliant because it's starting to eliminate that accessibility lag that we've traditionally dealt with and that need for somebody to remember to include me in the process of creating an app or a website. And that is a huge benefit for seniors because they're going to be included in more and more and feel less and less isolated um, and can continue to feel like they can still thrive without having to go into skilled nursing, thus reducing you know, Medicare costs. And AI can be used to monitor homes, to um, interface with caregiving professionals so that seniors can stay in their homes longer and thrive and use autonomy and choice to continue to self-direct their care later and later in life. Well, thank you. And so we touched how new technology, especially AI, can impact <laughs> people's lives. What about culture? Because I mean, this group of people here, we are all here to cultivate an inclusive and diversity culture, which is extremely important. So I'd like to also hear your view in terms of um, the panelists, in terms of how AI and also new, these new technology can really cultivate uh, the inclusive and also um, the diversity culture. 
So I have one, I think, really good example of how this can be possible. So Google has very recently released headphones that can translate in real time to 40 different languages, which makes it easier to travel, to communicate, and to understand one another. And I really think that's incredible progress. Um, one other example is that virtual reality is being used in empathy training. So the basic idea being that you can see what it's like to be in another person's shoes. You can experience a scenario from their perspective, or even the ability to virtually see where they're actually from is, is powerful. I think... Yeah, that... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Ceci. Go ahead. That's a great example, Tam. Uh, like, uh, even for the uh, hearing impaired, uh, the speech to text translation, the AI system that's uh, involved behind the technology, it will help them uh, go to any person and even talk to a person who is not uh, conversant with the sign language. That way, he can interact with more people. And uh, at uh, IRA, we do have agents which are like diversified, spread across, and we bring in like multiple kinds of people with uh, connect to the agents. That also kind of makes them include uh, inclusive uh, using the technology. Facial recognition is a huge part of this conversation, especially for the deaf-blind community, um, because the blind population can rely on hearing somebody's voice for most of our social interactions. And the deaf community can use um, just looking across the room. But if you are deaf-blind and you walk into a conference space like this and you're trying to identify somebody, you are pretty much reliant on them identifying themselves to you. Um, so facial recognition is a, a huge, as that begins to improve and evolve, will we'll continue to become a huge defining moment for deafblind, especially in employment situations. Um, the other thing that I see, and I'm, I'm doing kind of my panel on this later this afternoon or my workshop on assistive technology and AI, where they intersect as far as social and, and diversity needs with regards to ethics and with regards to inclusivity in best accessibility practices. So where do we say um, that web developers are responsible for continuing to code using WCAG 2 standards and, and you know making things accessible? And where do we say, oh, the AI can pick up? Um, Facebook is a classic example of this, where Facebook is launching this AI tool to describe photos, but it can't capture everything. And it's taught to filter and identify certain parts of a picture. I always call it the Facebook beard quandary. Um, <laughs> Facebook likes to identify people with beards. So you'll hear picture, um, two people standing, beard, feet, outdoor, water. <laughs> Just these list of random adjectives and, and nouns. And you're going, OK, so there's a beard and some feet in this picture and some water. I don't, I, what? Um, <laughs> It's helpful to an extent, but we're not there yet, and we're reliant on the filters that are built into that AI. So we're going to, later this afternoon, I'll get really in-depth as to how that can affect real-life situations for a disabled person. Yeah, thank you, Sassy. I think you also heard, I mean, from uh, Chiago's talk this morning, and some of the uh, facial recognitions already there she demoed, right? It's, it's awesome. So now let's take into uh, uh, some specific technology area, wearables and robots, and uh, where do you see the kind of role they will play uh, in accessibility? And some can be controversial, like a robot, right? It's, it's new, but wearables already here. So I'd like to hear, hear the panelists' view about, you know, specifically on wearables and robots. Sure. So I think there are already a few things on the market in terms of robotics that can help make life a little bit easier. You can have a robot clean your floors, mow your lawn. There are some things coming out that can cook for you, which is, is interesting. It's great. And I think we're seeing robots that can do more and more of what a human caregiver would do. And I think for the most part, this is, is great. Robots are sort of infinitely patient. There's no feeling of burden. They're available 24-7, 365. I do have one actual concern in this space, which is that the truth is for a lot of people, um, a good portion of their human interaction is with their caregiver. And as robots do more and more, we may see the sum total of human interaction for some of these people decline. 
So I think that's something we need to be aware of. Yeah, we still have to charge them. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. get the, the, the savior complex, I call it. I get approached monthly or more by people who have designed the latest wearable that will help blind people see. <laughs> um, which I think is a valuable contribution in and of itself to research and understanding, but devalues A, the travel skills that are innate in a blind or low vision person, B, the power of a mobility tool. So there are wearables from t-shirts to helmets with lasers to um, different belts with different haptic feedback. There's all these different pieces of technology and I think collectively they do represent advancements in what we can learn from our environment. But they are not going to cure my blindness as of yet. They would have to do eyeball transplants to do that. Um, and they're not going to replace a mobility tool in any healthy context yet. Maybe we'll get there in five or 10 years, but it's not like we need a cure or saving, we need enhancement. So I think as we move forward in designing AI, how can we enhance until we get to the point where we can be talking about a cure or a, a um, device that can replace the robo guide dog or the robo cane or something. We're not there yet, and I think we need to be cognizant of that, which is why I love ERA, ERA excuse me, because um, it combines human-centered assistance and autonomy with enhanced mobility function and doesn't replace a cane or a guide dog, or any other travel skills and tools. It enhances, and that's where we need to be focused. I also, I also want to jump in a little bit in that I think AI offers us the opportunity to start addressing new disability populations. Okay, so we have a lot of focus on blindness here, but I think there's also people with uh, pervasive development of disabilities, people with autism, people with Asperger's, uh, that can benefit from this uh, technology, not only because it's because it's getting smarter, because it's getting smaller and more portable and easier to manage, okay? So, uh, for example, people with autism may have trouble uh, understanding normal uh, visual cues, okay? Normal social cues from people. Uh, and I've seen research, was, this was like maybe 20 years ago or, or 15 years ago, where somebody came up with a big headset for a person with autism to wear that went over their head and it was on their chest and it gave them the um, uh, some some feedback about what somebody was thinking. Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they angry? Are they bored? Now, anybody uh, that knows somebody with autism would say this is absolutely nonsense because they have such sensory disabilities that come along with that or sensory issues that are not going to wear a helmet. But we're now 15 years uh, beyond that, and things are smaller, faster, and smarter. And I think it may be time to start looking at how to address new disability segments. Yeah, uh, as we said, in the space of like autism, robots can definitely help uh, interact with children, like and uh, enhance their uh, communication skills and uh, make them understand better. Uh, robots can also help uh, elderly. Uh, as uh, Tom said, they can be a good companion, but it's still not there, so they need to be more reliable. Uh, and in terms of wearable, I would say, yeah, there is uh, some momentum, like a lot of wearable devices now monitor elderly people and can provide alerts and feedback. And even in the space of like uh, hearing impaired, yeah, we can do an uh, IoT integration in, into the various uh, devices and provide a haptic feedback to the hearing impaired. So that way, a lot of information will be accessible. Anybody else would like to add? All right, if not, actually, I mean, let's take a look. We already looked at how new technology will benefit people and it, um, cultivate, help us cultivate a new culture, right? But on the other hand, as anything, new technology always face the adoption. And so now also let's take a look at it. Um, Mike, maybe um, pick your brain now because you haven't <laughs> talked much yet. And so, you know, what factors in both technological and, and, and uh, societal do you see uh, it's going to either accelerate or hinder the adoption of new AI, because I mean, when talk about, you know, if you, if you look at our population, the millennials, the young kids sitting here, no problem with digital, but your grandparents probably are not comfortable with the smartphone even, right? Let alone robots and AI. And and uh, actually quite interesting, when I was at the, uh, the Mobile World Congress, and some people even talk about they fear about AI. Are we going to be controlled by aliens? And so, so I'd like to hear you about your view in terms of adoption and you know what can accelerate such new technology and what could be uh, barriers. 
Well, I, I'll step back from um, AI particularly and just look at, at, at technologies in general and look globally. If you look at the, uh, the possible beneficiaries of, of this technology and others, they're all over the world and most of them have cell phones and most of them don't have computers. They're far more, they more have cell phones than have toilets. Um, and far more by orders of magnitude than there are our libraries, though we, we like to help. So thinking about thing, you know, in a technical sense, thinking that things that are accessible to people all over the world where connectivity may be intermittent, where they may be running on previous generations of devices, that will certainly increase diffusion. Uh, institutional factors like government support for that sort of dissemination to people who, who, who need the technologies but are not, um, uh, not in the wealthy industrial countries, but even within countries, things like intellectual property. So are these, are these technologies open? Are, can, we, can we build on them? Um, are they standardized? And we heard about uh, AI as a, a sort of a, a way to eliminate standards, and that's great. It bridges where, where no standards are available, but it also builds on so many standards for, for information communication, for even, even for the electricity to plug in your system. So you need a whole set and to be able to build on. And finally, I think empowerment is a key in, in diffusing technologies. Um, supporting people's ability not just to you know, ingest information, but to communicate, to communicate with each other, to then uh, to collaborate, to produce things together, to advocate, and to collect information on their life experience and their needs. Um, and, and I guess I'd end with one, is that the more valuable we can make these technologies to everyone, the faster this is going to be diffused. And when we, we're increasingly looking at things like autism or ADHD, not as binary disabilities, but as characteristics on a spectrum of, in which we, we all have different characteristics to these degrees. And the extent to which we can have our systems adapt to us. And we, in my research, we look at the building blocks of re learning. You know, everybody, when they learn, they have to get things into, mem into long-term memory, into short-term memory, and have the right level of arousal, have the, the right cognitive load, pay attention. These are all building blocks that we can start to detect and adapt to. They may differ in different populations. I'm paying attention with my eyes. Other people may pay attention in different ways. But they, they are all things that if our systems adapt to them, we will learn better, we will communicate better. Anybody like to add? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would like to echo the, the reliability part. Like, yeah, these systems need to be more reliable. We cannot uh, have an AI wheelchair climbing a stair, 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 stairways and then tripping off. And uh, there needs to be more standards and interoperability so that AI, as in uh, standalone, doesn't uh, kind of work. It needs to be integrated to a lot of other uh, systems. So this needs to be proper standardization and uh, interoperability within these systems. And number three, definitely the government regulations. Like if you have to have support uh, for autonomous cars that are going on roads, then we need to have proper regulations. And uh, it might take a while for it to come out. And I think IBM is already working towards that. Yeah, that's one of the key factor. I would just like to add um, one thing. So there's a bit of a virtuous circle in AI development, and AI needs a lot of data to do a good job. And in order for AI to be adopted rapidly, it needs to do its job very well. And I think it would be very helpful if a lot of the larger organizations that are accumulating huge amounts of data would be willing to share it because that helps people um, innovate, it helps them compete, and we end up with more and better systems faster.
Yeah, totally agree. I think uh, people's sharing data is a very important aspect because now there was a saying, you know, data is a new natural resource. Everybody want to hold on to that resources, right? I think this, Tom touched such a good point. How can we essentially make people more open-minded, share the, uh, the data? And I think where you also like to add something? I do have one, and, and it's related to it. Uh, what's the risk of AI? It's, it's the risk of what if it doesn't work, OK? Um, and I think you know, anybody in here doing work right now on accessibility uh, and you're doing mainstream product, don't stop, right? Don't say, I'm just going to wait for the AI guys to solve the problem. That's a huge risk. It's a huge danger, OK? So anybody coming in, into the space and doing AI research, keep going, all right? We want it. We want it really bad. But don't depend upon it being uh, the magic. Right, the silver bullet. Yeah, I would say good point. It comes to the innovator's dilemma. You have new things coming out. Do I stop working on the current stuff? Continue working on it because it's going to take a while for AI to be mature. And so this essentially also touched another point in terms of um, you know AI. Um, do you see any of the downside uh, when it comes to AI and robotics and for accessibility? Because I think we need to be aware of that. There are a lot of benefits, but like everything else, right? You always have the uh, you know flip side. And uh, um, what are the flip, potential flip sides, and how do we prepare for that? Building on what Will said, um, I call it bring your own ramp. So if a wheelchair user went to a restaurant and there was no ramp to get into the restaurant, um, you can't look at them and say, oh, you're supposed to bring your own. It, it, you can't carry equipment constantly with you that would bridge accessibility gaps in every situation. So it goes directly back to what Will is saying, we look at the digital and the technological space, and we're, as AI advances more and more, and this touches back to what I made in my last point, you know, we can't substitute good accessibility guideline best practices with AI at this point. We have to keep doing both. Um, so I see the pitfall being that companies are releasing AI and they're saying, OK, so now that this thing is out in the world functioning, we don't have to continue to uphold accessibility standards. We can just let the AI do it. And we can take the people who are on our team doing accessibility and put them towards something else now. So you see accessibility fall off in some pretty significant ways when AI steps in in some companies and in some situations. And we need to be hyper vigilant on that because people lose out. Um, in some pretty significant ways. I've seen this in the financial sector. I've seen this in um, social media, certainly. I've seen it in educational environments. And it's really detrimental because you start making these huge advances in accessibility best practices and, and implementation of them. And then you release a tool that's supposed to automate it and do it for you. And people turn their attention away. and across the disab disability population. It doesn't matter what disability it is. Someone's going to get it. Someone's going to suffer for it. So we cannot do that yet. We're not at that point yet. I see several of them just tried to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> I was only going to say, really, that I, I think there is a risk in uh, being too dependent too quickly, as you say. I, I think. You know, we're making incredible progress in, in computer vision, especially, and some tools can actually, um, if they make mistakes, be dangerous. So if an object is misidentified, you could hurt yourself. If a street um, isn't a street, it's a hole, that's the problem. So I think we will get there, but we need to be careful about timelines. Just like Pepsi for beer, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Pepsi Fair beer is good, but if it is something else, then if it is a one person to another person, it will be a <laughs> tricky situation. Yeah, definitely. That way, we are thinking towards having human in the loop uh, till the technology is like kind of mature enough and say it's like hundred percent foolproof, which might take years. And a lot of innovation goes into that. And definitely, I would request the youngsters who are working on the technology to be at par on that and make it more mature. So I'll, I'll, I'll quote Melvin, the historian Melvin Kranzberg, whose first law of technology was that technology is neither good nor evil, neither is it neutral. And, and what he means is that technology is disruptive. And the more powerful the technology, the more potentially disruptive this is. AI is really powerful. And if we look at the, the potential, uh, 
although you know we're not techno utopians we know that the, the telegraph didn't usher in world peace neither did the radio the telegraph i mean telephone etc cetera, etc cetera. uh the last 200 years of technology have been incredibly impactful in terms of our our well-being range of choices information we have and health but there are all sorts of systemic effects if we're relying on ai we're relying on ai to make decisions for us not right now they're simple decisions they're going to be increasingly complex who governs that how do we how do we understand what those are who's accountable for it what happens if it we it makes a decision that in retrospect causes you to do something that hurts someone we we have we need to make ai governable we also need to make sure that the impacts are equitable. Of course, the results are going to go first to, to, to people who have money and resources to use this technology. But we need to make sure that we continue to think of the, the impact on the rest of the world. And all of this information, this data that we, we put into it, we need to manage that. This is, uh, I, I study information privacy. and. Even with a little bit of information, you can learn a lot. And with the AI translator translating everything, you can, you can learn everything about someone. And so could your neighbors and the government. So how do we make sure that people have autonomy over their, their information that's collected and that it's, it's secure so that that embedded device doesn't leak your, uh, all your conversations that you've ever had? I think you bring up a really valuable point about autonomy. Um, seeing AI was launched recently by Microsoft, and I decided to take it for a test drive, literally. I was sitting in the passenger seat of the car, sticking my phone to the window, taking pictures when we pulled up at stoplights, going, I never knew what was on that corner. I just drove by it. Um, and I never stopped to think about it. I never, you kind of, glance at it in your imagination, but it's never a real world experience. And suddenly, what was going on in the streets around me outside of a car went from something that I could only imagine to an actual experience that I could partake in. And I had that autonomy to choose that. But you run into situations, especially in my work with seniors, where you see people being made to feel like they have to use technology when they would rather use person-centered care. They would rather have a volunteer or a care, personal care attendant or an IRA agent or something person with a human touch. Now, I'm never going to have the experience of getting into a car, getting cut off by a truck in front of me and flipping the driver off. Um, if AI comes to fruition to the point where I can drive, which it will because that's just my life goal, um, then I will be able to get into a car, but it will be driving itself. And probably at that point in society, no cars will cut each other off because AI will be doing all of the navigation driving and accidents will go down and people will be happy and there will be no such thing as road rage. And that's history in progress. <laughs> Lives change, people change, things change. Technology is leading that change. And you're right, it's neither good nor evil, but it's definitely driven by motive, Money, gain, knowledge, greed, um, hope. There's so many ways that you know technology can be applied in society that we have to keep the ethics front and center. We have to keep the implications of technology at the forefront of our consciousness as we develop it because it's only as good as its creator. And all of our biases and all of our filters are collected in this technology and used. All right, thank you. Such a good discussion. And I also, Peter's reminding me uh, we're running out of time. And so before we wrap up, and I think we would definitely want to hear from the uh, panelists about their um, view of the future. Because I mean, we not only want to know what's going on today, but a very important, how do we imagine uh, tomorrow, right, the future. So I think I'd like to uh, invite a panelist to share their view in terms of where do you see the greatest opportunities for AI uh, technology and accessibility? Whoever want to volunteer to go first is fine. <laughs> yeah, from my point of view, like if I were to put in my context of uh, IRA, I need AI to be in the edge devices. 
like uh, running AI, seeing ai in smartphone because smartphones are powerful enough think back like around 6 10 years back when the iphone got released it's not that powerful enough but now we can run seeing ai in your iphones in your samsung devices they are like powerful but all other wearable technologies also needs to be like more powerful for running ai at the edge that's one futuristic thing which i am expecting thank you sujis and anybody i mean the rest of panelists also have your turn to talk about your, your view about the I'll future. Just, I'll just say just a few words because I tend to be short. Uh, I think independence and equality okay, are the most important things to strive for. Tom, Sassy, and Micah? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there, there are some great things on the horizon, and I think self-driving cars are a perfect example. Uh, I think, you know, we're seeing incredible progress in some of the foundational technologies like computer vision, and we're starting to see databases of data built up to the point where these algorithms can identify a huge number of objects in the world and, and can also understand human language and, and help us communicate. So I think there's uh, a bright future ahead of us. Anybody who knows me knows um, kind of one of the stories that led me into working in user experience and accessibility, and it was tampons. Um, I needed to go to the store and get tampons. And when you go in and you say, may I have a female assistant help me? Um, and the female assistant tells you, I'm busy. There's a guy over there. He'll help you. And you're like, no, I need a female. And they're like, no, I'm busy. And the guy turns out to be a teenage kid who's working a summer job and really bored. And suddenly he has to help this blind lady go get tampons. And I didn't know blind ladies you know, needed stuff like that. So he yells out to the entire store, the brand of tampon that I want, the type, and where are they? And he's yelling at his boss. And his boss is yelling back. And I'm like, OK, mortification. Now I can pull out one of four or five apps or devices, walk into the store, quietly say to the device what I need, hold it up to the store shelf, pick up what I need, and leave with no human help. So when you ask me what the future is, I'm already there. Um, assistive technology and AI are already a daily part of my life, and it's only going to increase. I'm always going to be a disabled person, comfortable in my own skin, because I have a piece of assistive technology in my hand helping me where my body cannot. And that's just going to increase as AI evolves. Go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end by saying it's, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. But uh, there are, are, again, positive and negative forces, I think, on the, uh, the positive side. There are so many ways that it can, can help people now. And the potential for introducing this earlier and earlier in people's lives, one of the, the things that we've come to understand is how much learning at early stages affects people's entire life course and how much that can be affected by, by what we call disability. And so where we have technologies that can affect, adapt to learning, it will benefit everyone, but will particularly benefit people more equitably. And on the, on the not so positive side, we need to manage the governance, ethics, security, and privacy to, to prevent others from using this for their own purposes. Thank you, Mike. Any other comments? All right, let's give our panelists a round of applause. What <laughs> I, I believe we have five minutes for questions, right? Yes, Do we have? Yes, yes. And uh, if you have additional questions, we can always, you know, ask the panelists or myself during the uh, lunch break. And so I see um, a raised hand over there. I mean, do we have Mike? Hand over. Yeah, there was one uh, question over there. This is Brian Charlson, and I am the head of technology at the Carroll Center for the Blind. I've been teaching blind and visually impaired people to use technology for the past, God help me, 33 years. So 
My question is, and it's something that keeps, literally keeps me up at night, and that is the digital divide has not gone away. My life is filled with technology, but it does not describe the lives of the 70% of people with disabilities who are unemployed and can't afford any of it. And the programs that continue to fund virtually everything except services for older people. So the question is, um, do you think AI is going to drive down the cost of accessibility? Do you think the system is ready to accept that AI and things associated with access technology are just as important as the pharmacopoeia that we're fed on a daily basis? Yes. I think that AI is stepping in for instruction, acquisition. I think eventually we need to be looking at technology as medical. I think how we do that falls under the governance of AI and technology as a whole, and so it's a conversation and a policy change. Will it happen immediately? No. But it's definitely a conversation that needs to be forefront in all of our minds, and we need to be pushing for it. As Brian said, this is a huge gap in service, and we are the ones who have to step up and, and deal with it. Um, and I hate to put that burden on us, but we've looked at the government for 70 plus years asking them to do it. Hasn't happened. We've got to do it. Yeah, definitely AI is going to bring down a lot of these costs. Uh, even at IRA, we always encounter this question of like why the service is costly. And we are working with government agencies on bringing down this cost, but at the same time, there is a person sitting behind a computer and who is working. So it's always people are costly. So we are relying on AI technologies to bring down that cost by offloading some of the agent tasks so that it becomes more affordable. And from business perspective also, there are some initiatives that are happening to get this funded by organizations or uh, by the government itself via insurance so that it becomes more affordable. And adding AI technology is also going to bring down the cost. Well, I, I, this is Micah. I'd also add that as we use AI to develop things that adapt to everyone and they become integrated into consumer technology, you have less of the pathology of medicalized technology that is orders of magnitude more expensive than perhaps it should be. So having had experience with voice transcription systems and trying to obtain devices that were labeled as medical devices versus now they're built into to smartphones and the, the marginal costs have dropped, not just because the technology changed, but because it's been integrated and, and labeled into just something everybody has. Yeah, I think we can probably take one more question before lunch break, if there's one question. Yes, uh, my name is Narayan Bhatia, and I'm echoing further on the scene, cost to the seniors, so I will leave that person item there, but I'll pursue something else. I live in a retirement community where the average age is 86 and the median age is 89. At that age group, people have multiple disabilities. They cannot see well, they cannot hear well, they cannot walk well. Will the AI at least put a filter ahead of it saying, can you hear well before they start using the screen reader? Because the person cannot read well. And, and uh, so the disab multiple disabilities in the senior set is an important issue along with the cost of how do you introduce any of the AI-related solutions to them. That's just my comment, yeah. More and more sensory input, that's the population that I specialize in training and working with. And the answer is the more types of sensory feedback that we can give for output and input of information, um, and the more that AI can customize and, and use that information and get to know the person that it's working with. Um, the thing that we're seeing right now is, you know, iPhone technology is the thing that everybody wants to learn, but it's becoming so complicated because they keep cramming features in and cramming features in. So we keep coming back to them and saying, give us the ability to filter features out. Give us the ability to customize accessibility even more. 
more, more, more customization is what's needed to make AI be able to function with this population to a degree where it can help to bring down costs, keep people at home and comfortable and autonomous, and shift the care from a medicalized model to a social rehabilitation model where possible. Yes, and I think I agree with you, Sans. The personalization is really the next frontier when it comes to accessibility. It's not really one category. It's how can you personalize for individuals' need. Any other comment? I just had one thing to add with respect to cost. AI is software. It isn't a physical product with the same level of intrinsic cost. So smartphones are becoming ubiquitous. As was mentioned earlier, there are more people who have smartphones today than have a toilet. And it'll be, in large part, up to the people who create these intelligent systems to figure out what kind of pricing model works. But the truth is, a lot of access to intelligent systems today is, is free, and I hope it continues to be. For example, Siri is free. Google Assistant is free. And I hope that many new technologies will be as well. Yeah, I know there are more questions among our audience, so we do have to break for lunch. And so, I mean, if you have questions, as I said, we'll be there on the fifth floor, and we'll continue to answer questions there. So now, let's give them another round of applause, and we wrap up here. <laughs>